Hello, this is Graham Newbig, and welcome back to CS11747 Neural Networks for NLP. This time we're going to talk about building a neural network toolkit for NLP, MIN. So this time is mainly about our first assignment for the class, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this very minimal neural network toolkit, which we provided a template code for, as an example of how the internals of neural network toolkits work. So this is going to be relatively simple and straightforward, and we're going to look at lots of code today. So let's get started. So neural network frameworks, there are a lot of them, as we talked about before, Theano, Cafe, MXNet, TensorFlow, Dynet, Chain, or PyTorch, JX, among many others. And we're going to make another one. And the reason why we're going to make another one is uh, not unless you're very ambitious to usurp uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch from their throne, but rather to understand what goes on under the hood in these neural network toolkits that you're probably going to be using in your assignments. And perhaps the best way to start talking about how we implement a neural network toolkit is by thinking about an example application for which we would like to train a neural network model. And then what are the things that need to be implemented within a toolkit in order to make this uh, app uh, basically be realizable. And so for example, uh, we talked about the deep SIBO model uh, several times before, where we basically look up word embeddings, we sum them together, we run them through a couple layers of not, uh, affine transforms and nonlinearities, and then finally calculate our scores. But on a more abstract level, if we think about what the algorithm sketch for a neural network app's code looks like, it's basically uh, we create a model so we uh, set the model parameters that we're going to be using. Then for each example, we create a graph that represents the computation you want to be doing, calculate the result of that computation, and if we're training, we perform back propagation and we update our parameters. So in a neural network toolkit, Almost every modern neural network toolkit uses a special purpose uh, numerical computation backend. Uh, sorry, general purpose. And for example, for PyTorch or TensorFlow, these include things like MKL, uh, the Intel math kernel library for computation on CPU, uh, QDNN for computation on GPU, or custom written kernels. And there's many others, uh, other libraries that you could be using. For min, we're going to be using a numerical computation backend called NumPy that a lot of people are familiar with, or KuPy, a version of this that runs on GPU. So the way NumPy works uh, is basically you can create uh, arrays of numbers like A and B here. And then you can calculate operations between them. So np dot dot is basically a matrix multiply, multiplying these two matrices together. And the result of this would be uh, the multiplied matrix. These numerical computation libraries usually support many, many different operations. And that's kind of what's good about them. You know, if we want to be multiplying together, matrices or we want to be summing their dimensions, we want to be doing various things like this, they allow us to do all of this. So they can be very flexible. And as I mentioned before, KuPy is a clone of NumPy that works on GPUs. So you might want to use that if you want fast computation. So the underlying data type that we use in implementing a neural network is a tensor. And a tensor is basically an n-dimensional array. So this could be anywhere from essentially uh, zero dimensions, a scalar, uh, one dimension, a vector, two dimensions, a matrix, 
or three dimensions. Starting at three dimensions, we start saying three-dimensional tensor, four-dimensional tensor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all of these are, are tensors, so we have an underlying tensor data type that we use for this. The implementation that we have in min saves both values and gradients of these tensors. And the reason why is because, you know, as we've talked about several times before, in order to calculate uh, the parameters of a neural network toolkit, you need to be calculating gradients with respect to a loss function. So we implement it in this way. Basically, each tensor is responsible for knowing its values and gradients. So where exactly do we use tensors in a neural network application? This is one example, and tensors can basically represent parameters of the model. So they're essentially parts of the model that we would like to be learning. And they can also represent intermediate values. So for example, the values that we look up or the values that we calculate through our multiplications, affine transforms, et cetera, et cetera. So the tensor uh, data structure, uh, this is the first piece of code from min that I'm going to be showing you, but this is the tensor data structure definition. And this is where we're going to be putting all our data about our parameters, intermediate values, etc. So here we have our class definition and we have our initialization function. And the, this is relatively simple. We basically pass in a data and this data is a NumPy multidimensional array or uh, CuPy multidimensional array, but basically XP will stand for NumPy or CuPy or whatever uh, underlying computational library we're using. And so once we've passed in our data, we also have a gradient and the gradient should be the same size as the data. Note that we also have typing information here, and here the gradient can be one of two types. The first and most straightforward type is basically we have the gradient be another multidimensional array that's of the same size as the underlying data. Another option is to have a sparse gradient, and basically what a sparse gradient would be would be, for example, if we have uh, some lookup parameters, so parameters that allow us to look up a word embedding for each word. If we do this, then, you know, let's say we have uh, 500,000 different words in our vocabulary, we might not want to be storing and applying the gradients for each of these 500,000 words. So an alternative way you can do this is you can basically have a dictionary that has an integer ID and a array of the gradients for each element in this lookup. So basically what this union structure here is telling us is our gradient may either be dense or it may be sparse. Another thing that we keep track of in our tensor is which operation resulted in this tensor uh, coming into existence. And basically, for example, if this tensor is the result of a tan h operation, this would be a pointer back to that tan h operation. So this is useful for some algorithms that we're going to be using later. Okay, so now that we've defined our underlying data, I'd like to move on to the algorithm sketch that I talked about here. So the first part of our algorithm is basically to create a model. And this is an example of some mo uh, model creation code in our deep SIBO model in particular. So this is in the app code. And I'm going to make a distinction between the app code, which is basically the thing that you would be implementing for a particular application. So in this case, our deep SIBO model. And the distinction is being made with the backend code or the neural network toolkit code. And the neural network toolkit code is basically what we have implemented in min or PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, 
So in most cases, you know, if you're just using PyTorch, you'll never touch the backend code, but you'll be writing lots of app code. But in this particular assignment that you're going to be doing, you're going to be implementing the backend as well. So anyway, looking back at our app code, we basically have an embedding size, a hidden size, a hidden layer. You've seen this from previous classes. And we add parameters. So we add parameters where we have the number of words and the embedding size. So this is kind of our, our embeddings, our word embeddings. Also, we have a weight matrix for each of the hidden layers. So basically, this is a weight matrix uh, hidden size times uh, embedding size if we're in layer 0, or hidden size if we're in a, a future layer. We also have an initializer defined here. And I'll talk about what this initializer Xavier uniform means in a second. And then we have one of these uh, values for each of our hidden layers. And then finally, we have a weight matrix for our softmax, which also um, is going from the hidden size to the number of output tags that we want to predict. And we're also going to initialize this in a similar way. OK, so now let's take a look at the corresponding code in the neural network backend. So the first thing we need is we need a model. And the way we define a model is as a collection of parameters. And the collection of parameters is essentially a list of all of the parameters that we have in our model. And so in this particular case, this would be uh, a list of our embedding, uh, all of the hidden um, layer weight matrices, and then our softmax matrix. So we would have, you know, if we had two hidden layers, we might have four uh, parameters in this list. And every time we call the add parameters function, like we did in the previous slide, basically we give it a shape of the input uh, of the parameters themselves. So it might be a matrix or a vector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have our initializer, and then we have all the arguments to our initializer. So what this is doing here is this is basically getting our initializer, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in a slide or two. And then we initialize a new uh, set of data for our parameters. So uh, we do kind of random initialization, et cetera. And we create a, a parameter object here. So this, the parameter object is basically a tensor. And then we append these parameters to the list of parameters that we have here. So pretty simple stuff. You know, we, we set it in the correct size. We initialize it in some way, which I'll talk about in a second. And then we add it to the list of parameters parameters that the model has. For parameter initialization, this is actually something quite important in neural networks that I've glazed over a little bit uh, up until this point. So neural networks, one of the nice things about them that I've talked about is that they allow you to learn various features that capture characteristics of the input, essentially. But in order to do so, neural nets must have weights that are not identical. Otherwise, they'll learn identical features. So let's say we did the really simple thing and we initialized all of the weights in our neural network to 0, or all of the weights in our neural network to 1, for example. Essentially, what would happen is the gradients that flow into each of the rows or columns of the weight matrices would be exactly the same. So all of the features would essentially move in exactly the same direction during training. But that's not what we want, of course. We want some features to represent, like, for example, negation, while we want other features to represent animacy or um, the combination of negation and positive sentiment or something like this. So basically, you know, each, we want each row in our parameter vector to represent a different thing, but that won't happen if we just initialize 
weights in the simplest way possible. So one way that we could do this and one way that actually is often used in neural networks is just to uniformly initialize the weights in some range. So for example, we pick a random weight uniform between minus 0 0.1 and 1. However, there's a problem with this. Depending on the size of the parameter matrix that we're initializing, the inputs to downstream nodes or the inputs to downstream functions may become very large. So like, let's say we had a parameter matrix of size 1000 and the average input was uh, kind of on the scale of one, the variance of the outputs or the kind of span of the outputs could be within, you know, a thousand times 0 0.1 times one. So it could be, you know, within the range of 100 or so. And this is a very large range. And if we're using, for example, a function like the hyperbolic tangent function as an activation, most of the time this function would become uh, very sad saturated and become very close to one with very little gradient, very uh, close to minus one with very little gradient, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically the idea is we don't want the scale to get too out of control uh, for learning purposes. And so instead there are some other uh, initialization techniques like GLORAT uh, initialization, which is also called uh, Xavier initialization or initialization. And basically both of these are based on the size of the matrix. So take, taking the example of Glorat initialization, um, basically what you do is you take the square root of six divided by the matrix's input dimension plus output dimension. And this is kind of motivated by the range that neural network parameters need to be in to be passing good gradients back uh, during learning. So um, implementing this, uh, this Glorath initialization or Xavier initialization is one of the things that you will uh, try to do during the assignment. Okay, next, I'm going to be talking about um, graph creation and calculating the results of computation. And notably, we're going to be talking about creating a graph and calculating the result at the same time. And this is a distinction between uh, greedy computation, uh, where basically you do both of these at the same time. However, these two steps could also be separate. Uh, they could be and in the case that you first create the graph and then calculate the result afterwards, this is called lazy computation. And uh, PyTorch, uh, for example, uses greedy computation, uh, whereas uh, Dynet, for example, the toolkit that I created uses, um, or I you know, helped create, was, uh, uses lazy computation. And uh, TensorFlow has an eager mode where you can do greedy computation, but it also has a, a other mode where you can use lazy computation. So it, it essentially supports both. But um, yeah, this is a distinction that's maybe interesting to, to think about a little bit. But for the purpose of this assignment, we're going to look at uh, greedy computation like PyTorch. Okay. So how do we create the graph and calculate the output? So basically here uh, we reset the computation graph and the way resetting the computation graph, uh, what resetting the computation graph does is it basically clears out all of the memory that you've been using so far, uh, removes it. And so then within the application code, now we've cleared out our computation graph, so then we go in and calculate all the things we need to calculate. So if we're talking about a uh, bag of words, a uh, deep SIBO model, like I've been using as the example, uh, we have our word lookup, we sum all of them together, we uh, step through and do matrix multiplication, adding a bias, 
uh, calculating the tan h nonlinearity, and then finally calculate our output scores. So this is familiar, we've talked about this before. And so what does computation graph look like? So in many neural network toolkits, uh, the computation graph actually isn't made explicit and you don't look at it very much in, in app code. So basically um, here, we have reset computation graph. Uh, you actually don't ever really do this in PyTorch. The computation graph is kind of implicitly created uh, when you import the library. And so we have this global computation graph that we can be using for uh, keeping track of our calculations. Um, and then down here, we have uh, essentially a class method uh, for all of computation graph that's get CG and it basically will create a computation graph if we don't have our computation graph already. So um, yeah, this is, uh, that gives us our computation graph. And once we have our computation graph, uh, basically the computation graph is a list of operations. And operations are you know, any of the things that I just talked about before, like lookup, summation, uh, multiplication, et cetera, et cetera. And then within the computation graph, we also have a red reg op, uh, essentially uh, register operation function here. And what this does is it essentially sets the op uh, index to be the current uh, index uh, length of the ops uh, list essentially and then it adds it to the end. So basically what this does is it registers the op uh, into the computation graph. So what exactly do ops look like? But basically an operation has to know its forward function where the forward function is how to calculate its value given an input, so uh, f of u, and a backward function. And the backward function is how to ca calculate the derivative uh, given the following derivative. So if we think of this uh, kind of large f here is essentially our, our loss function, the, the last operation in our neural network with respect to which we would like to calculate a derivative, we assume that we are given this following derivative. And then we would like to calculate the derivative with respect to the input, um, with respect to the input essentially, uh, uh, sorry, the derivative with respect to the final value uh, given the input. And we use the chain rule to take the derivative of the output value, uh, the derivative of the loss or the final value in the computation graph with respect to the output value and update this, uh, this derivative. So to give a, a concrete example, um, if we have an operation, specifically the rectified linear unit or ReLU, the ReLU has a value that essentially looks like this. We have a value of zero at um, any input lesser than zero. And then we have a value equal to the input for any input uh, greater than or equal to zero. The gradient of this operation is essentially zero if the input is less than zero and one if the input is uh, greater than or equal to zero. And so if we look how we implement this, essentially for the forward operation, we are given an input tensor and we calculate, uh, get the data of the input tensor and then if the data is less than zero, we set the value to zero. So basically we're taking the input and we're chopping off uh, any value that's less than zero. Uh, 
we create a tensor from this output and we then store context. And uh, what I mean by store context is we essentially um, save all the values that we will need to calculate the backward function. So we save the input tensor, um, we save the tensor created from the ReLU, and uh, we, we save the array itself. Then in the backward function, we essentially recover this context. So we, we get all the context that we need. And if the uh, gradient of the output ReLU is not none, then essentially we multiply this gradient by the, uh, the value of the ReLU itself. So here, what this is saying is if the value of the ReLU is more than zero, we multiply by one, otherwise we multiply by zero. And then we call this accumulate gradient function, which is essentially accumulates the, this gradient within the tensor um, uh, of the input. And the reason why we want to accumulate the gradient within the tensor of the input is uh, because we'll use this for updating our parameters later if, uh, if these are, the input is a parameter. Then uh, finally, um, this is a class defining this ReLU function. For convenience purposes, uh, essentially what we do is we also define a function that defines this op and then calls forward on it to, um, uh, to get the, the value. So um, that the calling forward is basically where we're calculating the result of the computation here. Okay, so this is one example up. Um, if you're creating a neural network uh, toolkit, you'll want lots and lots of these apps. You'll want lots of different functions that people can use for uh, implementing neural networks, essentially. Okay. So let's move on to the, the next part. So this is performing backpropagation. And the backward code looks a bit like this. This is uh, relatively simple. There's not a whole lot to do here. And the reason why is because we have already saved all the context that a particular value needs in order to calculate its backward functions. So what we do is because we assume that we are calculating the gradient with respect to a particular value, this tensor T is the particular value with, which, uh, with respect to which we would like to calculate the gradients. So what we do is we start off with um, essentially the gradient of this being one uh, because it, uh, the gradient of that is precisely uh, what we would like to be calculating. And so we, we set that to one. Um, we locate the operation of this gradient, and then we step backward through the whole computation graph. So basically what we do is we uh, take the index of the op, and we just uh, step in reverse order through all of them. Uh, calling the backward function. Okay, and then the final thing that we want to do is we want to be updating parameters. And we've already talked about this a little bit before. Uh, there's many different update rules, including simple SGD, uh, updating with only gradients, momentum, updating with the running average of the gradient, Adagrad uh, updating downweighting uh, high variance values in Adam updating by, with the running average of the gradient, downweighting by the running average of the variance. So I'm just going to show the, the very most simple update rule here, uh, but during the uh, assignment, we're going to ask you to up, 
implement the slightly more complicated momentum-based rule. And this is the SGD trainer. And the way it works is you first initialize it. Um, so this is not anything really complicated, but one important thing to note is that it basically saves the location of the model. And you're given access to the model when you first initialize. So the reason why this is important is we're going to want the trainer to update uh, you know, every parameter that is included in the model. So we give it access to the model that it should be updating. Another thing is the learning rate uh, has to be set. So here we're setting it to 0 0.1, which is a pretty good default learning rate, but it could be set to something else. And we save that. Okay. So next thing to do is to actually do an update. And as I mentioned just before, basically we step through all of the parameters in the model and want to update them. The first thing we do is we check if the gradient is not none. So basically if this parameter has never gotten any gradient through training, like for example, it's never been used in training, we just skip updating it. And then the next thing that we do is we check whether the gradient is sparse or dense. And if the gradient is sparse, we do a sparse update. If the gradient is dense, we do a dense update. And then finally, we reset the gradient to none. And the reason why this is important is because basically we want to be able to accumulate gradients until they are done. And, um, or, sorry, accumulate gradients until they are ready to be used in an update and then clear them out after we've updated with them so we can start accumulating them again. So for updating dense, this is relatively simple. Basically, we take the learning rate, we multiply it by the gradient, and we subtract it from data. So if you remember, this is the, the very simple stochastic gradient descent update. If we are updating sparse, it's almost as simple, uh, just a little bit more complicated, where we have uh, the word index and an array, and we update only the, the part of the data at that word index. So uh, similar, but for example, if we had uh, 500,000 words in a vocabulary, this would be probably much, much more efficient, both with respect to time and memory. So there are still some things left that we need to be implementing. Um, we've left off a couple details of the underlying parts, like how do we accumulate gradients in the model, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd like you to take a look at those and implement that. And what about more operations? So I just showed you one example of the ReLU operation. Uh, there are others that are implemented in the example code, but there's some important ones like TANH, which we have not implemented yet. I would like you to try to look up the derivatives of these functions and implement them as part of the assignment. What about more optimizers? So we only did simple SGD, but what about optimizing with momentum, etc.? And also as a challenge, can you make a more sophisticated model? So, you know, maybe you don't want to do a bag of words model, but you want to do something uh, a little bit more complicated, like um, a model that combines together the words in a more sophisticated way. Um, or maybe you want to be importing uh, pre-trained word embeddings from a library such as fast text or something like this. So we've given some ideas about how you can further improve on this and I'm looking forward to the submissions from everybody on, and seeing uh, what you're able to come up with in the implementation. So that's all for my video today. It's a little bit short, but I'm looking forward to discussing more